I was joking with Tony Campos, like one of the first times I ever, I ever interviewed him. I'm like, dude, leave some of the bands for us, you know, like to <laughs> stop snaking all the bands, bro. You know, it's not just about being, uh, it's not about just about being a great bass player. Right. It's also about being professional. Oh, I know. You know? I know. Not the most talented dudes out there get the most gigs. It's, are you reliable? Do you personalities. Your, personalities. Reliable, you know, exactly. Yeah. You know, yeah, you knowing, can your, with... knowing your place. I mean, it's kind of, <laughs> it's kind of, some people might take this as insulting, but mm-hmm. it's kind of like knowing your place, yeah. knowing your position, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That you're, you're a hired gun and you don't get in band in the, you don't get involved, involved in the band drama, the band politics, the finances, mm-hmm. certain like that. You're right. just hired to play. And yeah. some musicians and actually some fans, they automatically think, that the that guy is in the band, right? It, really, he's in the live touring band, but maybe not so much the uh, you know performing on the records and stuff like that. Yeah, it gets into that wild area of of dudes that have been in bands for years and years and years, and you just assume they're in the band and they've they've been a hired gun this entire time. The classic one is the drummer from Billy Joel. You know, yeah, I don't know yeah, yeah. I saw, saw that, watched that documentary. Yeah. Yeah, that documentary. Yeah, exactly. There's no, it's, you know, some people don't realize that this is a business. It's a Mm -hmm. job. It's a job. You hire somebody to do a job, right? Yeah. And then sometimes people want to change their jobs. Sometimes people want to, you know, go to another, uh, this quote unquote, go to another band and play another band because they're offering more money. Right. You know what I mean? And then the fans are like, oh man, what happened to that bass player? He was in the band for 10 years. He was so good. What happened to him? Oh my God. (laughs) It's like, uh, He's just a hired musician. Guys change their jobs all the time. Yeah. Uh, the and people forget that. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think there's just so much romanticism around four teenagers in a garage starting a band, all for one, one for all kind of thing. And and once you get kind of past that initial phase, people start getting out of the band, or this guy goes off to start a family, and then you got new guys coming in. Uh, it's, it's tough for people to really look that there's, you know, there's the guy in the band that's the leader. And then there's the, you know, the, the, all, you know, the, what do you want to call them? Like pawns or something like that. You know, the, the rest of the guys are just kind of along for the ride, you know? But, yeah. And there's always going to be that one guy who's going to be the, the, the main guy, right. the main songwriter, the main lead, the main guy who does all the business, you know? Um, but you know, yeah, some people, you're right. Some people romanticize, uh, like, you know, and, you know, also, you know, four guys, you know, growing up in high school or whatever, junior high, high school, mm. they're all getting together and start a band. That's a thing of the past. I right. mean, there might be a handful of bands out there that are like that, but the majority are hired musicians or people have come and gone in bands. And it's just, that's just the way it is. Yeah, it's still wild to me when I interview people and they talk about, uh, still getting a re- getting in a room and hashing out songs and writing at the rehearsal space and things like that. Like it's that's such an archaic way to to think nowadays because now it's so much you know file sharing and I'll send you my parts and oh our bass player lives in New Zealand so I got to get him his his parts and things like that. So it's 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 wild how you know back in the day if you didn't go to the same guitar center or the same guitar store and see the same bulletin board that said guitarist needed like you weren't going to get in a band you could be one town over and still not know about that person but now it's like the world and the internet and everything has brought everybody so close so a long time ago uh back in the 80s 85 or so uh i used to work at a sango shop i was an yep. 18 year old kid working in a sango shop dave mustaine walks in I knew who he was. Mm-hmm. I was like, wow. Um, it was it was like, you know, I was freaking out meeting him. And I gave him free food. I gave him free sandwiches and I gave him free alcohol. <laughs> nice. And I figured if I give him this free stuff, maybe I could pick his brain and ask him some questions. And so I would, when I would get, a, if he's still sitting there, I would take a break and I would go ask him a bunch of questions. <laughs> I was kind of like being fanboying out. Oh, right? yeah. But, I, but really I was trying to figure out how to break into the music industry because I was just fresh off the boat straight. Uh, I was from a small town a place called El Central, California, which is like three hours outside of LA and came here, got my first job at a sandwich shop, met Dave. And I said, how the fuck do I start a band? <laughs> right. And he told me connect to make connections. And so it was really, that was one of the, one of the main things he said, he said a bunch of stuff, but that was one of the main things that I really, 
uh, used it to my advantage. It was this goes try to find like minded people, try to find guys you connect with, try to find people who are serious and want to do this for a living, blah, 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 but make connections. Mm -hmm. And so it was really kind of funny because he actually uh, invited me to a show. Oh, wow. And he brought me backstage and he introduced me to people. And that's pretty much how I started meeting people. Um, and there was a thing called the Music Connection, which is a which was a free newspaper here right. that you can get back in the we're talking like 1985. You know what I mean? Right. So that was the only way I could like, you know, see ads for people looking for musicians. And um, I started auditioning for other bands in that thing. Um, but nobody wanted to hire me because I, I was either too young or uh, my style was too different. So that was when I realized, okay, I need to start my own thing. And that's pretty much what I did. I started – my own bands. I started going to shows, started you know seeing all the metal shows, and just started meeting people. And that's pretty much how I met Raymond and Burton to start Fear Factory and other bands like Brujeria and stuff like that. In those auditions, any any one of note or any musicians of note that you uh, you you would have played with back then? Uh, no, there was just like local bands. Um, uh, one of them was called Tormentor. They said I was nice. too melodic. Okay. <laughs> they were kind of more really fast speed metal, yeah. borderline grindcore ish, early grindcore ish. They said I was too melodic. Um, there was another band that were called the Four Horsemen. They were okay. on American Recordings, which was Deaf, right. which was uh, Rick Rubin's label. They were called, it was Deaf, Ameri Deaf Jam, right. turned Deaf American, and then it went to American Recordings. And there was a band called um, the Four Horsemen, and I was, you know, 18, 18 years old. Uh, they gave me a cassette. I learned the songs. They were like a, they were like a Danzig meets ACDC, which okay. was at that time, which was what Rick Rubin was really doing a lot because he did Danzig, which was very dry, you know, very, you know, basic stuff, and then you had the Cult. He did right. a Cult record which is very ACDC. And so I can see why um, he, Rick Rubin wanted to sign this band, sign this band. Um, but I auditioned for them and actually I didn't even make the audition. You know, right. they gave me the cassette. I learned it. I called them back like in three hours later because it was so easy. Basic ACDC stuff, right? Um, I called them three hours later and I said, I said, okay, I, I, I'm ready to audition. I got it. I, I didn't really know how to, the process, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I called them up. They're like, uh, we just spoke to you. I go, <laughs> I know, I got it down. They're like, they go, how old are you? And I go, I'm 18. I goes, they go, oh man, you're too young, kid. <laughs> Hung up on me. I was, too I, was, young. I was wondering if you, you might have came off too arrogant or something. Like, you know, I don't I don't know no, how I was just, I was gun ho, I was excited. Right. Yeah, I got it, I got it. You know, it's like, they were like surprised that I got it that quick. And I was like, but this is, you know, I, I grew up learning ACDC songs. You know what I mean? So right. It was like, it was like, it was nothing, no new territory for me. I was like the, uh, the, the story of kind of the fear factory sound kind of, um, I heard you say at one time you were listening to the, uh, the outro to one and you're like, let's yeah. write music like that. You know, the, da -da 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 -da, you know, with the starts and the stops. Um, what else were you kind of listening to back starting starting Fear Factory? Oh, well, well, you know, obviously when I was a kid, I grew up with all the Well, I grew up with a with my I we had a very big family. There was 10 of us all together, including my parents. And everybody liked something different. My father was into mariachi music. Uh my mother was into rock and roll, Elvis Presley, Beatles. Um my one brother was into country and punk rock. Weird. So it was like Sex Whistles Clash and then Eddie Money and stuff like that. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. Johnny Cash. Um, Johnny Cash, yeah. Um, but, you know, my sisters and one of my brothers was into Journey and Scorpions and like um, uh, uh, Frank Zappa, you know. Okay. And my, my sister was into like Alton John and Pink Floyd. And it's just, 
it just all varied, you know what I mean, from different stuff. And so I grew up with a melting pot of music. And I liked I liked a little bit of everything. Right. It wasn't until I heard because back then Scorpions wasn't exactly metal, there was still rock, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but when I heard like ACDC and Sabbath, I mean ACDC is still rock, but ACDC and Sabbath was really what opened the door for me. I'm like, okay, that's some heavy shit. And then, <laughs> you know, by the time 81, 82 came along, you know, obviously getting into the early Judas Priest and Iron Maidens and Metallica's and Molly Cruz and stuff like that. And I just really, it just really grew from there. And of course it progressively got heavier and heavier. Right. But I was also a fan of other stuff too. Mm-hmm. I mean, new wave, Gary Newman, Stuff like that. Really into eighties new wave a right. lot. Uh, I dated a girl in high school that was really into the new wave stuff, and so she exposed me to a lot more stuff. You're also kind of uh, credited with with the term new metal, the new coming from. Uh, I've kind of they've kind of related it back to new breed. Uh, you know, yes. obviously the Fear Factory track. Um, talk a little bit about like, kind of that that term new metal and kind of being associated with with kind of the the genesis of the term. Well, well, in England, they noticed that there was a lot of new bands coming out. You know, obviously, Fear Factory, uh, Machine Head, um, uh, you know, of course, Corn back in 94, 95, 96, when they really started to hit out there in the UK. Um, and uh, a lot of new bands were coming out. Obviously, Cold Chamber, you know, uh, 94, 95, you know, Spine Shank. Uh, there was this whole new movement coming from LA. And at that time we had a hit record called Demanufacture. It really blew up in the UK. And they took the song. It used to be called the new wave of British heavy metal. Right. Remember that? That that came from the 80s, mm-hmm. early 80s, new wave of British heavy metal. And then they were saying a new wave of metal. And then when they heard the song from Fear Factory called New Breed. They started saying, they started using that term, the new breed of heavy metal. Right. And then they decided to shorten it and just call it new metal. (laughs) That's pretty much how it came about. That's how they described all the bands that were coming out of LA at that time in the mid to late um, 90s. And then it just kind of grew from there. And the new metal term just kind of was exposed and it was out there. and And then it just became an actual thing. I was going to ask you, you know, kind of growing up in the L- the L.A. area for you, obviously the late 80s, you know, the thrash and uh, all the heavy stuff. And then there was that that weird lull in the in the late 80s, early 90s um, of just kind of the clubs kind of being a little bit more empty than normal and things like that. But there was a lot of like a lot of like funk metal going on and a lot of like just just like metal at that time was kind of awkward in that 92, 93 era. And then obviously you start getting, you know, bands like Corn coming up and coal chamber starting like you're talking about obviously fear factory hitting things like that uh, that talk about kind of like that weird period of, kind of in between like the like the glam era into the in, in, into the new metal era well you could definitely you could definitely thank nirvana for killing all that because uh, <laughs> i mean it literally was gone overnight right. you know what i mean the minute nirvana hit the airwaves radio MTV, boom, they completely changed their format. You know, a lot of people don't, a lot of people who were not there at that time, who didn't see the music scene Mm -hmm. happen at that time, they might not be able to fathom it because they were not, they were probably too young at that time, but it literally changed overnight. It changed the landscape of music. And we were right in the middle of all that. But, you know, but there was other stuff that was big it, it it not only cleared glam metal, it also it also made thrash metal dormant. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I'm not going to say thrash metal was completely gone because some bands were actually still trying to put out records, but a lot of people were trying to change their sound. Because if you look at even if you look at you know uh, Metallica, Load and Reload, those were, those were <laughs> you know <laughs> they were even trying to change their look and their sound. They were even trying to go, you know, more alternative. You know what I mean? And and it and it just there was this weird period 
where that you, you, I literally seen one scene die and another scene fucking become huge, which mm-hmm. I was into as well. I love that stuff, all that early sub pop stuff. Um, you know, Amphetamine Reptiles was another mm-hmm. record as company as well. Like putting out the first helmet record was heavy. Me and my friend Henry from Butcher Babies, he's a guitar player. We were just going on about early, early helmet before yeah. they broke. It was heavy stuff. And also, me and Burton used to go to all these shows. Early Nirvana, when they were playing like small punk rock shows, we were going to see Nirvana shows. You got to realize that LA at that time to me was from when I got here in 1985 all the way up to 1995. There was this a good 10 years of just new things cropping up, things changing and just seeing it all, Mm -hmm. you know, bands like ministry doing industrial metal or, you know, early nine inch nails, uh, you know, the first record seeing, seeing them tour on those first record. And they were not that big playing small clubs. Um, uh, the whole industrial scene coming up, you know, skinny puppy, uh, put out a record called Do Too Dark Park that got really big. You know what I mean? All that early stuff. And I was just, I was just like a, me and Burton were like sponges and just <laughs> going to every show and just falling in love with everything because we were just, we just appreciated everything. So early Sonic Youth, Mud Honey. I mean, I could keep going on. Pixies. Uh, even the goth scene was massive out here. You know what I mean? Uh, early Cure with Disintegration record. Fucking mm-hmm. amazing record. Love that going to see them play, you know. We were just absorbing everything, and that you know, of course, metal was in my heart and always in my blood, but I love so much other stuff, and just seeing all that stuff was, was amazing. And I mean, we would go to everything, I mean, we would go to fucking Fields of the Nephilim. I don't know if you guys ever even heard of that band, it's I don't like, know what that one is, yeah. like spaghetti, spaghetti western god, okay. <laughs> um, you know, Sisters of Mercy shows. Um, you know, they, uh, I'm trying to think of every band. Viamon <laughs> Nagalas. Viamon Nagalas was a girl who just had a bunch of different effects, and she screamed. She screamed on microphone and just doing <laughs> crazy shit. Yeah. yeah. We would just go to everything, you know, and we loved it. And I just loved that era of music because new things were coming out, and old, and other things were disappearing and it's right. kind of funny how you know things you know things come in cycles you know what i mean so oh, yeah you know the whole the whole uh obviously you know n- people are saying new metals back you know there's some bands who never disappeared right. there's some bands during that time period of like after 95 and going forward there's some bands that didn't disappear like corn was one of those bands that sustained that level all those years mm-hmm you know what I mean? Whereas like Limp Bizkit kind of came, kind of started, got p- really huge, disappeared for a little while, then came back. And there's been a few bands like that. And uh, kind of like us, I guess you could say. <laughs> <laughs> right. But honestly, it wasn't because of a music scene. It was because, um, you know, lawsuits and band changes, band member changes. Yeah, there always always does seem to be something going on at the, uh, the in the Fear Factory camp. So, um also, another thing too that was really cropping up was the early, you know, death metal and grindcore mm-hmm. scene. That thing was coming up, like from you know the mid '80s to yeah. the early '90s when it's reached its peak. You know, bands like Morbid Angel and Napalm Death and Carcass being like, being like big, big at that time. You know what I mean? I remember one time there was a, there was, at the Hollywood Palladium, which is like four thousand people here in Los Angeles. It was one show. It was like, it was a. Uh, I can't try to remember. It was, I think it was a uh, Sepultura was headlining and a few other bands playing at the hall. It sold out. Right. And then down the street was Cannibal Corpse and a bunch of other bands that was sold out. I mean, that was like, you know, that was like 10,000 people at two different shows. Wow. And it was amazing. It was, it was massive back then. It was, it was a great time to be around at that time. Cause it was new and exciting and it was fun. You know what I mean? Yeah, and that's just how it was, you know. Going to the 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 best example was, was like early Lollapaloozas, the beginning mm-hmm. of the, the first Lollapaloozas. We had Susie and the Banshees, Ministry and Raising Against the Machine, and Ice T with his body count, and mm-hmm. you know all the times uh, you got to see early Soundgarden and stuff like that. You know, 
I mean, there's a there's a video of like the second ever Rage Against the Machine show, and they're playing like a park, and they're they're already a well oiled machine. It's it's insane how good that band was, like right out the gates. Yeah, I think the some of the members were in another band yeah. called Lock Up or something like that. Yeah, not not be to be confused with the grindcore band lockup. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's yes. one of the, that's one of those uh names. Uh you know, talking about you know the sound change of Nirvana and things like that. Like I remember I I was I would have been 12 in 91, but like still I knew I was listening to something different because my cousins were big into you know Cinderella and Guns N' Roses and and Poison and Motley Crue and all that. And I was I was into that too because that was what they were playing and I really wanted to be in a band but I was like I'm not wearing eyeliner and tights and you know things like that i was just like that's not right so i saw you know you start to see smells like teen spirit in the first uh, pearl jam 10 and and just just knowing something is different sounding and, and like oh you don't have to look like a woman to play in a band you yeah, know you can you can actually just go out in what you're normally wearing well everybody dropped the makeup and the hairspray yeah. and they went to flannels and, and 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 you know doc martens right you know what i mean and ripped yeah. up jeans and you know it's cut off cut off jean shorts. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was, a, that was a big thing. I mean, we, uh, uh our, our old singer Burton ha- worked at a, a place called Nana's, which was a, uh, kind of like a, the fashion for grunge, grunge okay. fashion store. Right. And they had every color of docks at the time, <laughs> burgundy, blue, black, you know, white, whatever. And he worked there and every day he would be bringing us, be bringing here you go here's some new doc martens and we were we were wearing the shorter cut mm-hmm. like the mid doc martens not the tall ones or the right. short ones it was like the mid ones and so if you go back to early fear factory shows you'll see us wearing those free doc martens that he got us <laughs> that was kind of our look i just had a pair of uh i had a pair of um sweat short sweatpants mm-hmm. that i would cut into shorts okay because that was the look kind of back mm-hmm. You just you just got some pants, you cut them into shorts, and you wore some like thermal, uh, thermal underwear that would go from your ankles. Right, over. right. Yeah. Oh yeah, the, yeah. the thermal the underwear look. is that's the look yeah. right there. Yeah, that was the look and the flannel. And so we were a cross between that look and metal shirts. Mm-hmm. So if you go to some of the old pictures, you'll see our jean shorts. I mean, our jeans cut or whatever we had sweatpants cut, and that was kind of the look. And so we were across between those two things. Uh, talking about things coming back around again, my stepson is 16. And for Christmas this year, he asked for a pair of Jinkos. I was just like, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> and like, we bought him a pair of Jinkos and he is wearing the hell out of them. You know, <laughs> I was just like, and I, and I feel older now because that's, you know, I, I never could afford Jinkos back in the day, but always wore big baggy clothes. And then now I understand why my parents were like, why don't you wear something that fits? You know, you'll look nicer. And I always just want to be like, you, you know, you're so handsome. Put on some clothes that fit, you know? Yeah. We were, uh, we were explaining that to Milo yesterday, our, our new singer he's yeah. from Italy. So he saw some of that, but he didn't know how extreme it was because mm-hmm. <laughs> there were some pretty big, Oh yeah, pants. Yeah, the, that, <laughs> I mean, they look like Clydesdales. You know what I mean? Like, you know, <laughs> then it starts things. to rain, and you got half a soaked leg of rain all over the place. And yes, and I see that some of them were longer, and then people mm-hmm. were stepping on them. And then there was like strings of material from your jeans, and oh, it's a, it was it was a wild time. <laughs> yeah, it, it's coming back, and I think it's I think it's fun. I think it's that's cool. crazy. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, definitely talking about like the the new metal era kind of being a dirty word there for a while. Like even when I went from from playing in notable new metal bands and like I would try to get in audition for another band and be like, you know, telling people that I was in a new metal band. It's just like, all right, well, we'll, we'll try. Yeah, but that, that's not that's not something to put on the resume. And now it's like, dude, you you played in Primer 55, man. That's crazy. You know, like people hit me up all the time on Facebook and stuff. I always I always uh, you know, laugh about people like, oh, Fear Factory was on this record, on this record, Digimortal. Yeah. Uh, you know, I guess you could you could hear some of the new metal elements, mm-hmm. right? But I always laugh that, that that's what they call the new metal record in some ways. Right. But but if you really look at it, it's if you go back to our very first record, there's a song called Scapegoat. 
And it's very much like corn blind, Mm -hmm. but just two years prior to that. Yeah. Or three years prior to that. And it's like, I feel like we've always had that groove element, that new metal groove element in our music from day one before it was even a thing. Right. Yeah. I mean, definitely that song is kind of, come under some scrutiny over the years like did did ross slip them that tape early or did you know did they really write the riff you know without without knowing you know you got a lot of you know uh wonder what happened there yeah supposedly that corin was in, i guess they had another band called sex art or whatever or some i don't know one of the other there's a there's a another guy who's credited for writing that right right he's not he was not in corn but he was in one of their other bands mm-hmm. that they had. And uh and I've recently I've recently ran into that guy. I don't remember his name, but he was trying to tell me that he wrote that in 1983. And I said, Well, I still got you beat. <laughs> right. You. you know what I mean? Right. <laughs> so but yeah, now that guy's making money off that song, and I think it's pretty funny. That, That's crazy. You know, but then you you, you take that riff. And then you apply it to Cold Chamber. Mm-hmm. This is the way it's got the beat. Da, 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 da. <laughs> they sped it up. And then yeah. even Slayer has that similar riff. I think I want to I want to say Diablos and Musica. Mm-hmm. I can't remember what song, but it's there. You know what I mean? So it's kind of like people always get mad at me when I say, hey, look, these like certain a certain groove or a certain riff. And can like go, uh, you know, could tra- I, I call it tra- they could travel to other songs, yeah. and keep going and going and going, you know what I mean? Yeah, and that's just one of those riffs. And I was really into Helmet, mm-hmm. and Helmet had a riff similar to that, and I was like, fuck yeah. And this, I literally wrote that song after going to a, to a see a Helmet show in 1991. There you go, Ian Burton went to go see Helmet, we came back. I was like, fuck, I got a riff. You know, just just the inspiration and being so excited seeing that helmet show going and because they, they had grooves, man. Back then they had grooves, heavy grooves. That's funny too. You know, you're talking about you kind of really wanting to write songs similar to the outro to one, but then when you get down into it, then it's uh you know, the outro to one is really just darkness descends by Dark Angel. Yes. I mean, you could say I don't. I don't know if Lars was listening to Dark Angel and took it from there. I don't know. Right, right, right. But it definitely the the production on the Metallica record was miles ahead of the production on that. Uh, oh yeah, on that Dark Angel record. So, um, but the Dark Angel riff goes. So the, the riff's different. But right. the drum pattern was the same. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Well, Metallica just focused in on that that one particular drum beat with the guitars being exactly syncopated to what they were playing yeah. with the stop start thing. And I was just always like, why can't they do more of that? I was always, you know, really yearning for that from Metallica. And they just never really got into it uh, further than that. And I was like, man. So, you know, a few years later, that was 1988. Mm-hmm. So by 1990, I was like, okay, now that I got the drummer and Raymond who could play that kind of stuff on, on the kick drums, I'm like, okay, we're going to write these kind of riffs and write this kind of stuff. And that's pretty much that one little piece of Metallica is what inspired me to do pretty much almost every song in Fear Factory <laughs> where the kick drums <laughs> follow the guitar. Which is the other that their Fear Factory sound, which which in in a weird like turn of events, then you know Gene Hoagland joins the band, you know years later, and it's just like this entire, uh, you know, butterfly effect of the entire world or something, you know. Yeah, it's funny because I, I didn't even know about that story till after he was out of the band. Mm-hmm. You know, he he started talking about it in the interviews, and that's how I found out. Like he he didn't say anything to me uh, when he was in the band about it. Somebody working on the HVAC in my house. <laughs> oh, good. I was like, all right. So I don't got know some, how. Got some industrial sounds going on. Yeah, right. It's, it <laughs> actually works out. <laughs> like you might write a new song after this interview. 
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like, but it's really kind of funny, you know, being a musician, how certain noises mm-hmm. can inspire you because yeah. you, you, you think rhythmically. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, it's well, like every time I'm driving, I turn my fucking my left or right signal on my turn signal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, dun, 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 dun. you think this? You, know, you think right? It's it's it. Sometimes it just drives you crazy. You hear something like some machine or just whatever, mm-hmm. and you're thinking rhythm- rhythmically, and it's just like, get it out of my head, ah, you know. No, there was always a joke going around of do you remember those old dot matrix printers where it's like da, 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 it would they would they would print out like a, a line at a time and it, and everybody would joke just like that's how Meshuggah writes their music is just just listen yeah or they would just listen to old Fear Factory and find riffs there too um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, just talk about uh talk a little bit about the early days of of, of Ross Robinson and kind of technically you know kind of being one of the earliest bands that he really worked with and what he well, became yeah. Well, I met Ross back in the mid. Uh, I, I don't, don't remember exactly what year, but we were both very young. We were still mm-hmm. very young, and Ross used to play in a band called Detente, which which uh, which was a band. I want to say 86, 85, 86. and so I would go to the rehearsals. You know, I was not in any band at the time. So I would go to the rehearsals, and um, he was he was a guitar player. You know, he had that Randy Rhodes Jackson. He had that Marshall. You know what I mean? And so mm-hmm. he had all the cool pedals, all the <laughs> cool stuff. And he was just really into that band, uh, his band. And then, and then something happened with the band broke up. They started another band called Murder Car, and with, with <laughs> Dave McLean, with Dave McLean on drums. Oh wow! With Dave McLean from. He was in Machine Head and also in Sacred Reich. Yeah. So, so for those people who don't know, other, um, we all became roommates. All three of us were roommates. Me, Ross, and Dave McLean in Hollywood. And I started a band called the Douche Lords, which was <laughs> like, which was like a a, a rip off of SOB meets the Mentors. And so we did our first demo with Ross Robinson. And um, yeah, so that's when he started getting into, into production side. And he started to, he learned from a guy, a guy named Dana Strum. If I'm not mistaken, it's Dana Strum um, that he learned how to do production. Really? Yeah. Wow. I think he's not, Dana Strum is in Slaughter. I think he's also in Vince Neal's band. I think. Yeah. Yeah. So he's, he, you know, he's uh, one of those guys that, that that was producing rock bands back in the day, and I think I think Ross learned a lot from him. And also, we were working out of uh, Blackie Lawless's studio. Blackie <laughs> Lawless from right. from Wasp. He had a he had a studio called Cherokee Studios. Okay. And yeah, in Hollywood. So we were doing uh, our demos out of there, Fear Factory demos. So we were doing them out of there, of course. You know, he did our first record that never came out called Concrete. And I used Ross Robinson's uh, Granny Rhodes Flying V, tuned down to B. <laughs> tuned down, yeah. Right. And it was really, it had a floating bridge. And we had to figure out how to keep that bridge from floating because when you're tuning down lower, you know, the, the bridge is going to drop. So I remember having to figure out how to do all that. It was great. We figured it out, and it was it sounded killer at that record. And you know, we had other songs that we didn't even get to record. One of them was "Scapegoat." Um, you know, Ross knew every one of our songs. He he was at our rehearsals. He, you know, came down and you know gave us a few pointers and things like that. Or just you know, he was like one of my best friends at that time. Mm-hmm. Like we were really close. I um, mean, we did everything together. You name it, everything, and uh, not not sex, but I'm just saying everything else <laughs> we did together. Right. Um, and uh, yeah, so he was kind of like a little bit of my, a little bit of one of my early mentors as well. You know, just because he had all the cool stuff, and and uh, but he didn't have my right hand. That was the one thing, and so he really liked that. He really saw 
that Fear Factory was going to do something great. Um, and so he really wanted to, you know, be uh, our official producer and so on. And um, but things didn't work out. Um, but we did record an album quality demo. Right. And it was called Concrete, which came out many years later. <clears throat> but he would get he would use that demo. I had a cassette. He had a cassette. Obviously, he had he had the the reel to reel tapes because back mm-hmm. then he recorded on tape, right? So he shopped it around to try to get to produce other bands. So he shopped that demo. You know, saying, "Hey, he would go to other bands and say, "Hey, I can get you this production. So this is what I've done recently." You know what I mean? And we were using the demo to shop to record companies, and so um, record companies, everybody turned us down. Even Roadrunner at first turned us down. It wasn't until Max Cavalera from Sepultura, who heard the demo. Actually, you know, saw Monty and told Monty Connor at Roadrunner Records, you need to sign these guys, right? But before that, us and Ross got into a legal dispute because we didn't want to sign his contract because he mm-hmm. gave us this pretty extensive contract and we didn't want to sign it. And the, the lawyer said, if you sign that contract, you're not going to own anything. You're not going to own your songs, your publishing, your recordings. You own nothing. So we're like, hmm, maybe we better not sign this. So things didn't work out. Um, we ended up sp- splitting ways with Ross Robinson. We kind of fell off friendship-wise after that. Um, and then, uh, so like I said, we were able to shop the demo. Yeah. We, we just couldn't release those recordings. Neither could Ross. Ross couldn't release the uh, recordings either. So we took a bad thing and made it into a good thing. And we eventually got signed and Ross ended up, you know, a couple of years later signing or three years later, getting corn on a production deal. And then boom, you know, obviously he blew up, the band blew up. We blew up on D manufacture. So, you know, it, it, all, it all worked out good. And now we're friends again. <laughs> That's good. How deep into the fear factory catalog were you guys recording on tape? Um, I'm trying to remember if we recorded on tape on obsolete. I don't think we did. No, okay. it was uh, definitely sold a new machine and, and D manufacturing. Okay. And just kind of over the years, I was thinking about this, listening to, um, aggression continuum the other day, just like how, how the, the recording process has changed so much to where oh. what you're, what you're doing back then is kind of what people are doing now with, with the, the, you know, the matching, the kicks and just being so precise. Like that's the one thing, you know, demanufacturing all those old records, like they're just so precise. And then like, and back then obviously recording to tape would have had to have been a, a task to where now it's kind of like, you could just line it up if you, if you mess up. Yeah. A lot of people, uh, you know, thought that demanufacture was a drum machine. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And that like, no, we just, we just, me and Raymond just really focused me and Raymond, the drummer, mm-hmm. we just really focused on being tight as fuck, trying to be syncopated and being tight. And we just, we rehearsed, you know, five days a week, Monday through Friday. You know what I mean? Every day. We were, me and him, if nobody went, you know, a lot of times nobody else was around. It's just me and him jamming, <laughs> just getting music down, getting tight, 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 until we just, when we recorded, when we recorded the record, it was just spot on. Um, Whatever happened to Raymond? Do you talk to him at all? Um, I haven't talked to Raymond in a little bit. Uh, not, not, uh, not recently. I just know mm-hmm. he's working on his other companies. That's about nice. it. Um, well, let's get on to uh, the Slaughter the Martor uh, mm-hmm. with Machine Head. Man, what's what's your history with uh, with Rob and Machine Head? Oh, Rob was at one of our first shows. One of our first, the first time we toured America. We mm-hmm. opened up for Biohazard and Sick of It All. Wow. And it was 1993, sold a new machine, and uh, Rob, uh, uh, Rob had heard about my Marshall. I, I had this Marshall head, and it was modified. Okay. And it just had this particular tone. And Rob had heard about it and actually came out to our show in 1993 
when we played San Francisco. And, you know, we met. That's when we first met. He was like, dude, I heard about this head. I got to fucking hear it live, blah, blah, blah. And he was just going on about by tone, and he was really into it. That was 1993. And, of course, I think 94 was the first Machine Head record came out. Mm -hmm. um, but I believe he ended up using the original uh, 5150 with a tube screamer. I think that's what he used on that record. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, uh, you know, it, we both came up in the scene together. You know what I mean? Uh, obviously, he was started much, many years before me with violence, mm -hmm. you know, and probably some other bands that he was in. But yeah, uh, you know, we would just became friends ever since 1993. I mean, that's 30 years. <laughs> so what, that's the one thing that's getting me, you know, the, the, uh, when when the black album turned 30 i was like all right that was that was you know my my major introduction to metal was the black album but it's still like that was not my youth or whatever but like this year is like kind of like a lot of these 30 year old milestones like burn my eyes and all that are, are gonna hit 30 years to th this year and i'm like man that is just that is just too much <laughs> yeah i got some i got some friends in the music industry that i've known for for i mean since i was i was since i was a I'm not going to say a kid, but mm -hmm. in my late teens, you know what I mean? Right. Like Ross That's Robinson, mm -hmm. Ross Robinson. I mean, I met all the, I met like every grindcore death metal <laughs> band way yeah. back in 90, from 1990 to 19, you know, from 89, actually going back to, well, even before that. Wow. I met, I met Dave Mustaine back in 1985. You know, it's like I met these guys many years ago, you know, many, many years ago. Yeah, I was standing near Dave Mustaine at the uh, at the recent Louder Than Life in the media tent. I was doing stuff with Knotfest, and uh, just just standing near him. I mean, I met him in the '90s, I think, but like I haven't really been around him since then. And it's still just like that's fucking Hangar 18 right there, you know? Like <laughs> you're just like yeah. still freaking out that uh, just just being in the presence of the man. Um, I have a I had a really good friend. Her name was Nancy Fulcox, and she used to be my roommate and she mm -hmm. knew everybody. She was actually from the Bay area uh, and she knew everybody and all the bands and all the Bay area bands. So I met a lot of people through her as well. Um, that's the first time I met James Hetfield. You know, he was at, in my apartment. Oh, wow. Drinking, drinking Jägermeister. <laughs> you know, it's just like night. The, the, they were mixing and justice for all. Turning the bass that's, down. That's when I met him. Yeah. <laughs> were you and, the one did you hear like a rough mix and you're like you know there's too much bass <laughs> no I, 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 I no he was very closed and secretive to that yeah. um but i also from there i met jim martin from faith of more yeah and i met the rest of the guys in faith of more through him and so jim martin was a guitar player in yeah. faith of more and yeah i met a lot of people from that whole era of music but even before that before i met her I met all the guys in Testament, Exodus, you know, back in the early, in the, the mid 80s when I first got here because um, my sister knew the owner at the time of Golden Voice. Okay. Golden Voice is a very huge company now. They do Coachella. But back then, they were doing punk and metal shows. And so I, uh, through my sister, who knew the owner of Golden Voice, production company, um, uh, promotion company, whatever you want to call them. Um, I met them. I met them. So they gave, they got me free passes to all the, all the, uh, um, thrash shows back in the mm -hmm. day. So I got to meet all those guys way back in the day. I see pictures where I look like a young little kid. You know, I was a little kid meeting all the guys in Testament, Exodus, and all those guys. And just, um, uh, I got old pictures of all that stuff and it was cool. I didn't only just get to play the music. I got to meet the guys in the music and I didn't right. get, not just to be, uh, you know, somebody who just standing in the crowd watching the shows, but that was also part of my networking. If you know what I mean? Oh yeah. Um, to steal a Josta term, were you ever a punisher to any of these people? Do, do you look back and go like, Ooh, I probably, uh, laid it on a little too thick there. No, no. Um, I think because I learned early on, like not to be that way because I worked 
in a sandwich shop right next to all the production studios in Hollywood, like like television and movie production companies, right? And I saw famous people come in every day, right? And I mean, you name it, all the different soap stars, mm -hmm. the different, you know, uh, television shows, uh, you know, all the guys in Motley Crue, Quiet Riot, you know, Dawkins, all the early, you know, kind of glam metal bands, right? Rat, they all come in there because there was also a recording studio down the street too. So whenever anybody wanted sandwiches or burritos, <laughs> there was a, a burrito place next door to our place. So people would always come. There was a lot of traffic mm -hmm. from those studios coming over. And um, so I got to meet those people. I just knew how to be cool. I just tried to, I just figured it out, not to punish them. Plus our boss, of the, the owner of the sandwich place, also told us, don't bother them. You know what right. I mean? And so I learned early on just to be cool. You know, it's kind of funny. You're taking their sandwich order. And then maybe I'll ask them a question. You know right. I mean? <laughs> Slip in a too fast for love question or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, man, I love that record. I love that song. Well, like, hey, cool, cool. There you go. You know what I mean? They're like, hey, yeah. thanks. You know, they would, they would think it was cool. And they would come in all the time. Uh, I've heard the, obviously, the Mustaine story a few times. Was, was there anyone else that came in that you kind of picked their brain to of giving them a free sandwich or some beer here and there and, and got to pick their brain too? No. No, I think Dave Mustaine was the only one because I was really into, you know, the Metallica record, you know, the Metallica records. Yeah. So I was really into that. That was the only one that really blew me away. I mean, of course, there were beautiful actresses that would walk in there too. And I mean, of course, you know, right. I'm an 18 year old kid. I'm like, what's up? You know what I mean? <laughs> but they, they were not going to take me seriously. I'm fucking making a sandwich. You know what I mean? <laughs> With my hair tied back. Right. In one of those like early nets. Oh, you know nice. I mean? Yeah, that's a good look. <laughs> here I'm making a sandwich or something, so they didn't right. really take me seriously. But you know, I met, like I said, I met everybody in Motley Crue and quite all those all those bands. I, I loved all those bands and all the guitar players, but I would never really, you know, ask them too many questions or stuff like that. I never really bothered them. I just let them know that I know who they were. Right. Just as we kind of wrap up, man, how 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 is the band? You know, how are you enjoying this kind of iteration of Fear Factory, new singer and all? Well, I think we have a very, very, very killer lineup at the moment. Um, everybody in the band is just firing on all cylinders. Pete Weber is in, he comes from a thrash metal band called Havoc. He's an amazing fucking drummer. He fucking rips it up, and it's really kind of cool because he not only plays everything to the T, but he also adds new fills or new little double bass things in there, which kind of makes the song kind of breathes new life into the song as well. Um, and of course, Milo, you know, he's pretty much hitting every note every night. He's definitely learned a lot, you know, doing 120 shows that we've played so far. So yeah, everybody's, everybody's firing all cylinders. Um, we have Tony Campos on bass. Of course, right. you know that he's a veteran just like me. <laughs> um, but when he, when he doesn't, when he's doing static X, like for instance, on this machine Head tour, he's only going to be doing the first few shows. Then he's got to go. And link up with Static X and Seven Dust. He's mm -hmm. doing that tour. But when he does, um, when he does that, our bass and guitar tech Javier Arriaga fills in for Tony while he's gone. Nice. Yeah. Have you seen a change in uh, Milo? Uh, what, what kind of change are you talking about? No, no, no. Have, I was going to say, have you seen a change like in him from the beginning of the band? And now oh. he's kind of, kind of 120 shows in, or whatever you were saying. Like, you know, is, are you seeing a different guy out there, or you know, just yeah. even, just day to day? Oh, 100 percent, 100 percent. You, you know, when he first came out, he was excited, like ah, running everywhere. Ah. <laughs> then you realize it's like, wait a minute, I need to, I need to conserve my energy and, you know, uh, concentrate more on. I wanted him to concentrate more on working the crowd, his banter, which he's got down really well. You know, banter, like talking in between yeah, yeah. songs and getting the crowd hyped up, things like that. Um, and not just being like some crazy wild man on stage. <laughs> the early shows. You're yeah. like, I, I enjoy the enthusiasm, but just calm it down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, 
it just in that way because you know because when you're having to do that style we're doing aggressive and then melodic mm-hmm. you know a lot of the um you're using a lot of breath you're using a lot of you know uh breathing breathing techniques and so he um pretty much learned not to to when to go crazy and not to go crazy right um, I mean, he, he also, sounds killer, man. So, also, oh. feeling very comfortable on stage. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying he was. I'm not saying that. You know, he was extremely nervous, but you know, he definitely was nervous. I'm sure. I mean, we all still kind of get nervous. I mean, it, it's it's natural. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I get nervous. I get nervous for him or Pete or Tony or Javier. I get nervous about the show. Is mm-hmm. the show going to go well? Is you know what I mean? That's what I get nervous about. I don't get nervous like, am I going to fuck up? Oh my god, there's a lot of people here. I don't get nervous about that. I get nervous about you know, is everybody going to do well? Right. You know what I mean? Um, where I know when he first came out, he was definitely nervous as hell. Well, I would fact, think that that's what he's right here. <laughs> well, I was going to s- sure. Let's go ahead. You know. Hey, what's up? What's going on, man? How you doing? What's going on? Great. Just woke up. <laughs> <laughs> Living the yesterday. Dream. Yeah. Just landed yesterday in LA, and it's been a long trip as always, but uh, fighting with the jet lag as, as always, but you know. No, I actually just asked Dino. I was asking how how you have, uh, you know, the, your entire time in Fear Factory, how much have you changed from the time that you first joined the band to where you are now in the band? I, I think I changed a lot, like Dino was saying. Like I feel like I'm, I was thinking just just today. I, I feel like a different person. You know, <laughs> it, it, it's that is that big of a change. I think. Uh, I think I was a different person b- before the first tour. Then I became a, another different person after the after the first tour, and another mm-hmm. different person after the second tour, and so on and so on. Uh, so I think it, it's it's the change is that big. You know, it really changes changes you completely uh not just musically and, and as far as being like a good frontman goes but also like like as a person you know it's it's, it's, it's that crazy because this is a huge life change you know mm-hmm. oh. how much how much touring had you done prior to fear factory how much what touring had you done prior prior to fear factory uh almost none okay. i mean that was my first touring experience you know uh I've been playing professionally for more than 20 years as a drummer more than 15 as a singer and of course in that uh that's because of my family which is uh my both my my dad and my mom are professional musicians they've been working in the music industry mostly italian music industry mm-hmm. uh and uh and playing like my dad's a guitar player my mom's a, a singer and singing teacher so of course you know I, I had uh uh like a paved path in the music uh business i would say but uh not this level like it was it was still like a local scene like right. local scene in rome and a little bit in italy but uh you know the, like I, I think i never actually toured just just like probably played some gigs abroad you know around italy but touring in an actual bus you know first time and you know it was it's cool i love it <laughs> um what's the one thing that that maybe growing up when you see touring on a bigger scale, like you're like, I can't wait to do that. And then when you get to actually be, you know, day to day touring, what's the one thing maybe you didn't uh, expect? Uh, I would say probably expected everything, you know, like (laughs) it, it it was, it was like a, everything was as I, as I expected, I would say, you know, both like, pros and cons like i've been following these guys for for since forever you know like like even like interviews and stuff like mm-hmm. that you know i'm that much of a music freak like when i like a band i'm, I'm obsessed with the band i follow every interview right. i can find and stuff like that you know so if, if i was another guy and you were interviewed the fear factory singer i would probably watch your interview as a fan <laughs> you're like ah let me check it out right <laughs> right know? so uh and uh i i made myself an idea of what what it's like to to be on tour by following you know my favorite bands doing interviews like digital tour bus and stuff like that you know mm-hmm. it, it was it almost felt like 
I was there, you know, and uh, and it's cool because uh, I remember that one of the first Dino told me about tour is that. So you know what I got to do on tour, and I'm like, oh yeah, I did my homework. So, you know, baby wipes and like, <laughs> flops. <laughs> got to bring my own pillow. <laughs> you know. So yeah, but yeah, I I, I would say pretty much uh, everything was pretty much as I expected. Probably a more top you know tougher tours like south america was a little bit out of my expectation like more than expected in, in terms of uh you know how tough it is because it's tough you know you flight every day you don't you don't always sleep at night you get to sleep the next day in the afternoon so but i was still say you know it, it's uh it's it's still in the range of what i expected you know so nice. and and i'm loving it you know and really at first, I was like, "Oh, let's see if I like it." You know, you you never know. You mm-hmm. you may become you know the most famous rock star in the world, and you end up just not liking it. But I I love it. So, and it's uh, out. last one, and then we'll get Dino on here, and I'll get the, I'll, I'll finish up. But mm-hmm. uh, the last one for you, man. Um, being you know chosen as the singer of Fear Factory, but kind of having to keep it under wraps for so long. Like, how tough was that on you not to just like start telling friends or start like leaking it out? Like you know, a burner account on the internet, like, Hey, I hear the new singer invite me, uh, Milo, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> like anything like that. How tough was that for you to kind of keep it under wraps? It was kind of tough. I mean, it was tough for, uh, like, uh, enthusiasm perspective. Like I was so enthusiastic about, about this new, you know, I wanted to shout it to the world, of course, but, uh, I had not to leak it, you know, was, mm-hmm. you know, it was like, you, you know, you, you don't have to leak it. We have to, schedule it in in the right way you know do the the announcement in the right way so of course you know it's common sense you know you can't you can't just leak it right so uh i i I was just holding it of course the only people that knew about that were my was uh where my family my mom my dad and my brother and uh my best friend my my bandmates like those very narrow Mm -hmm. people in my my you know life uh but they were like you know i was like dude you have to keep your mouth shut you know it, it's so they they were really they're, they're my you know uh closest people and and uh they were good in in not leaking it you know and maintain the secret but uh the p- problem is was that uh all those covers that dino asked me to do were on youtube and people started liking it liking them uh, so much that someone started speculating that that guy could be the new guy, you know? And mm-hmm. uh, so that that's where my name started leaking. And uh, so some people already kind of knew, you know, but I was still, I think we still did a good job in oh, um, yeah. keeping our mouths shut. <laughs> <laughs> awesome man well uh i think he uh he definitely picked the right guy from everything i've heard so far man you sound killer in the band so uh thank thanks you for, man. thanks appreciate for uh, sitting that. down with me man thank you appreciate that very much <laughs> <laughs> all right i want to say definitely thank you for you giving us this opportunity <laughs> yeah. and for everybody out there who's supported the fear factory for the last 33 years um we got this huge tour coming up with machine head and orbit culture so it's going to be killer. So if you guys want to get tickets, go to fearfactory.com and there you can get all the tickets or go to all, any of our social medias and you'll see all the advertisements and links there. So I hope to see you all out there. And again, thank you for the support. You know, man, thanks once again for taking some time with us. Hell yeah. Thank you. <laughs>